don't know if uh, Michael, you remember Wilfred from our prior conversation. Um, yeah. My recollection was the uh, that that there was a phase of your work that was the legal tech social innovation le social innovations from around the world with regards to law. And, yeah. But is that is that the current phase of your 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 universe, Wilfred? Just to to catch me up, my my apologies if I um, missed. Uh, Part of the thread, but very happy to to catch up to to where you've gotten to thinking about systems change. Yeah, no, yeah, I come from uh, legal innovation, uh, social justice innovations uh, around the world. I was head of an accelerator based in The Hague, um, but I expanded a little bit when I saw that I got a bit more worried about larger issues around climate change, or uh, so I. I set up an initiative called Humanity Solutions, which is still linked with some social justice things, but also looks at um, pollution or um, yeah, some broader issues. And it. uh, but it's fairly it's fairly nascent, and I, I can send you just also to speed you. Yeah, the, I, I also I, I have an initiative called Foresight Properties. It's more properties that have a, a chance to to help you uh, to move towards a, a future that makes sense. Um, so I, I, I run a few nascent initiatives right now. I'd like, to, yeah. I'd, I'd like to understand better the portfolio of the inchoate as well as coordinate that we have our uh, Nikhil has joined us here today, and I'm looking forward to introducing Nikhil to both to uh, folks on the line and other colleagues. Uh, it's it's excellent to to include you, Nikhil. Um, I think that uh, there's multiple threads of cross referentiality because, uh, well, Nikhil, would you put your your hat as the systems change observatory? Is that what the way to allude to what you do, or m maybe we could have the micro. Uh, introduction and we may come back to you with a more detailed time for sharing a little later in the call too. Sure, absolutely. Um, hi everybody, can you hear me? Uh, I'm Nikhil, the yeah. girl. Um, I work with the System Change Observatory which is based out of Oxford University. Uh, we're housed at the Skoll Center for Social Enterprise and um, we basically are an observatory for system change. We're trying to build a longitudinal data set to empirically show how change is created. Um, Bobby and I recently connected about a month ago, and I've been interested in connecting with your community to learn about more about what everybody does. But uh, happy to give a more detailed uh, intro. And uh, as part of that context, Carl, um, have you seen the intersectionality between fair share model and systemic change observatory? Have, have, you, or have you tracked their work? Because I'd say there's some intersectionality you could say as, in, in other words, is it the right way to look at systems change observatory that you all have been identifying systems change efforts around the world and you've been identifying uh, theoretical and analytical frames to understand them and to be connected through them to the systems change efforts of the world? Is that the way to, to to express it, or, or how would you yeah, describe I mean, it? I, I agree. I think for now we're trying to codify how everybody sees system change because there is a um, understanding <clears throat> in the sector now that everybody has slightly different takes on the topic. Um, there are many different traditions to system thinking. Uh, the, it can come from a supply chain perspective, a political economy perspective. It can be climate change related. Uh, you know, similarly. So like Eleanor Ostrom's work on the commons, you know, that's also systems thinking, but it's not called systems thinking. So currently our effort is to look at it very broadly and understand how this language has been shaped over time. Um, and we're studying this at the venture level where we're trying to basically study how social enterprises create change. And then we're also studying this at the funder level where we are like taking annual reports of these funders who are doing systems funding essentially um, and studying how this language has evolved over time uh, and understanding how they their work has informed uh, the sector and then there are translation translational research efforts that we're doing where we're trying to understand with the people who are enacting systems change what are their daily concerns what how can our research basically 
inform their work better because we understand there's a big divide between the academic side of systems thinking and the practitioner side and the effort is to really understand what people are looking for like recently you know we've identified a couple of topics impact measurement being a very prime candidate for things people are looking for you know all these funders uh, social enterprise funders who've been around since like the last 20 years like omitya or school their initial uh, effort was to set up the field of social enterprise okay now that's sort of done everybody knows what social enterprises are and they they feel like they've achieved that so the next step everybody's thinking about is now impact measurement uh, you know th there is a missing uh, gap in our measurement protocol where we're not taking a systems approach to our measurement at all so how do you integrate systems in that and that's a question that's come up again and again so i'm kind of here to talk we've to got, uh, we've got good good evidence on aspects of that question here on the call and among other colleagues and carl did you want to riff on that question of um, metrics that can be integrated with systems change processes i mean i i would argue just at at outside level that there are uh, ways to look at metrics as part of the, the matrix to achieve agency at an individual level. If we look at the 100,000 combinations of ways in which someone could learn to be a compassionate project manager or an empathetic product manager or a um, human resource business partner who can navigate ambiguity, every combination of those reflects a systems change gap where if a person were to to wish to self-direct and have agency over time if they found the right roles at the right moment at the right time they could achieve that agency so if we think about metrics as reflective of individual and collective agency carl is that something you'd like to riff on yeah I, I mean, it's a big question um you can hear me right yes um so you know, I, th I think if you go back hundreds of years, the idea that a patron would be supporting a variety of non-commercial type work, could be in the arts, could be uh, in other types of good works, that type of relationship between owners and how, how what kind of work or, or tasks were sanctioned has been around for a long time. And we get into the modern corporate age where uh, external capital is needed because it's not, it's not a benevolent patron who is deciding they want to sponsor a particular kind of uh, enterprise, but rather it's attract, attracting investors. Um, the bargain that we traditionally had is that, well, it, any any group of owners could sanction any type of beneficial uh, work or a practice uh, that they wanted. But in the modern age, we tend to attract capital not based on the good works that are going to be done as much as what the value is. And the the I, I say in my book, there's three capital structures. The, the, Conventional one is at the time the equity capital is being raised, you have to come up with a value for that future performance. And oftentimes that's strictly commercial. How much, how much uh, revenue are you going to create? How much profit are you going to generate? Second time of, type of, of uh, capital structure is a modified conventional one, and that one is what venture capitalists and private equity firms use. They'll provide the capital, they'll come up with a value of what they want to, to uh, they envision the company doing, but they'll have deal terms that protect them from overpaying. My book, The Fair Share Model, describes a third type of capital structure for a public offering where anyone can invest that no value at all on future performance when the money is being raised. Rather, the investors and the employees have to agree on what is the work. And there's a reward mechanism there for stock, voting stock that the uh, employees hold that can't 
convert. They so in a sense, Carl, just to bring this back to yeah, the you, to make one point. You, you can use social social benefit as a trigger to, to create a reward. So, you know, it just needs some creativity. If an enterprise requires capital, you have to figure out how you're going to attract it. And traditionally, we've done it by using commercial measures, but it need not be that. Um, and any any enterprise, whether it's uh, funded by one person or a group of people, you know, if it's all about alignment. And it, and if, if they all want to support a particular type of effort. Uh, there's no reason why they can't do it already. It just doesn't happen that often. Well, I think this reflects the the bridge I'd like to make, which is that I think that the social enterprise sector has tended to be orienting towards retrospective metrics of performance historically. And I think that a lot of the systems change sector is orienting towards prospective measurement. So orienting towards whether there's a future context that we can have as a goal to reach and then being able to, to get there. Um, I'd like to include uh, Mark Moulton and Sanjay and um, Wilfred here too, likewise in, in these threads. Hi, Mark. Uh, we have a new co person here on the line. I, uh, he's representing the Systems Change Observatory, which um, we can also share a link to in the, in the thread. And uh, I think that it, it's it, one way to say if we have prospective metrics for systems change, what we're talking about then is can we align the incentives of institutions that exist today and individuals that exist today in a Venn diagram of overlapping goals in which those metrics become feasible to reach different metrics. So if you think about the this connecting to the Ostrom case, you mentioned Eleanor Ostrom and uh, the tragedies of the commons, there's management of certain scale commons in which the externalities are visible and obvious to everyone. But at the, at the, if we if we want to build collaboration at the scale of our prevention gap, then we want to have every prevention gap in every uh, stakeholder set that we can identify to be an opportunity for collective agency. But uh, let me let me connect this to colleagues. So. Uh, Mark, do you want to introduce yourself to Nikhil to include him here? Sure. Hi, Nikhil. I'm Mark Moulton. Um, I work with Bobby on various different uh, <clears throat> interests in my main uh, work for the last 15 years has been on uh, climate disruption and the impact that that will have on uh, cities and natural systems. And part of what we've been talking about is, can we get the insurance industry interested in investing some of its profits in ways to ameliorate the, the uh, difficulties that we're gonna get into with climate disruption? Um, thank you so much, Mark. And Wilfred, did you wanna summarize what you were sharing about this portfolio of the inchoate initiatives that are each related to systems change, but that you're shepherding? I, I didn't know how to paraphrase them, so maybe I'll yeah. let you speak for it. No, just uh, for those who don't know me yet, my background has been a lot in governance and legal uh, innovations and access to justice innovations, but I have also started some, because it is related to climate change and everything else, so I've also initiated a few initiatives that are broader in scope, like Humanity Solutions, uh, Semanity, which is an event format to help shape futures that you can imagine that that you can go to like what, what you refer to bobby uh and and foresight properties which is a kind of you acquire a property today but you also have a vision of the future of that property so you can co-acquire and so things like that um and but it's quite diverse i can send some links so you can have a look at it uh for those who are interested i what I, what I think is interesting is two things that I note somehow and that I would like this group to also give me some input on maybe is one, I mean, there is quite some actors who are busy giving the illusion of agency to individuals who often don't have as much agency as, as they think they have. So that I, I think that is something that's happening. And the other can you, thing- can you, can, you, can, you, can you share an example of 
when that would be it's uh, there's occurring. there's just a lot in the justice sector for example a lot is determined by the large institutions and some monopolies on power and and on, on justice and on the state but then there's a counter movement with uh, justice entrepreneurs and social justice entrepreneurs but um sometimes i mean it is also just there is a part of it which is giving people the illusion that they can make a difference to to stall time or to you know to not make the necessary changes within the system because you have a few individuals who think they can make a difference and and this is the this is a negative perspective i'm not saying this is always the case but it is also something that that, that happens um but the, the other thing i see is that this what i'm trying to work on a bit now is more this what is an imagination of a nice future in 10 or 20 years, a tangible timeline? And there's not, I find there's a, there's really not that much out there that's either well, co-created. Solar so. punk, I mean, what, would, wouldn't solar punk be the, the place where that's happening at scale right now? Or would, what do you think of solar punk? Yeah, so, so I'm not so familiar with solar punk, so this could already be, I, I'm struggling just to find the good places where, where there's a lot of that. So I'll, I'll look into solar punk. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, solar punk is a great example. Uh, there's uh, 4,000 documentary films in the solar punk genre. Uh, each one of them reflects something in the real world that is a micro case study in an aspiration, an aspirational feasibility. So it's effectively 4,000 social innovations that are profiled around the world that are each um, road signs to a future that is feasible without violating the laws of physics and while achieving the aspirations of humankind. And so the example of, um, in solar punk, you have examples from living tree construction in which they've gotten hundreds of trees to merge in the Balbotonic into one 12 story tall building in Stuttgart that replaces the steel, concrete, and iron over time in every floor with the living tree. And the group that designed that, they've then identified in the solar punk future, they wish to have cities of millions of people entirely from living tree construction. And so mm -hmm. solar punk is one level documentary film. And then they also have several hundred novels and books of short stories that have come out in the solar punk genre. And each of those footnote, the works of the 5,000 paintings of the solar punk genre, and they footnote the uh, solar punk documentaries. And the documentaries reflect that they're hyper-realistic in the fiction, that they're near-term hyper-optimistic, um, and yet they're still a narrative orientation. So, I mean, I think it's a group of about 50,000 people originally in Brazil that... Okay, that's great. Example, it's an entire on future so existing, and there's other genres. But I think this reflects, uh, um, Michael, this might be a nice time for you to share part of what you were uh, uh, previously, which is that there's, you know, the, if, if, if um, imagining these future places, that we think that we can get to. I mean, I think we've done some of that at crowd doing with the um, uh, biophilia example of looking at how you could get nature density in hospitals or nature density in cities to prevent air pollution deaths. But I think that you could across uh, solar punk, you can say, you know, what is every category of shift we need to be resilient and regenerative? And if we want to go um, up, uh, dozens of levels of increasing the prevention at dozens of intervention points. In other words, every time there's a tragedy, there could be 10 levels of intervention prior, there could be 100 levels of intervention prior, there could be 1,000 levels of intervention prior, or there could be even a million levels of intervention prior. In other words, every upstream moment that can prevent the contribution to that risk is an opportunity to prevent that risk. And so scaling collective agency vis-a-vis -vis our risks. Um, Michael, did you want to talk about that me metaphor? Because you know, in a sense, we're talking about a sedimentary process where each risk has uh, every, every layer. 
and we can prevent it from every layer of interaction from a minute before to a year before to a decade before to a uh, hundred years before. And within that spectrum reflects agency. You might want to tilt down the, the, the video camera, Michael, but we'd welcome you to, uh, to, to share if you wanted to express some of that and introduce yourself to Nikhil. Hi, uh, Nikhil, I'm Mike Critelli. Can you see me? Yes. I can't see, tell. Good, thank you. Um, I, uh, some of my best experiences in prevention have come by assembling a group of people. And one of the most important principles of the collective uh, activity is to tell people that uh, nothing bad will happen to them. If, uh, in other words, it's, it's almost, uh, I, I actually did something like that in a financial and business context. And I was inspired by uh, the, in a completely different context, obviously, Nelson Mandela's notion of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But when something bad happens, the first reaction of a lot of people is, am I going to get blamed for this? Uh, or is, are the rules going to change in a way that's adverse to me? So the first part of the bargain to get people to open up is to basically say, let's take a look at this where we're not looking to assess blame. In fact, we're going to make a definitive decision not to assess blame. So when you look, for example, at the COVID-19 crisis, uh, what's made this toxic, and I don't mean that, and I mean this more metaphorically toxic as opposed to a physiologically toxic, is that it's in a political environment and uh, it's been hijacked to find blame. And uh, what we need to do is, and what I'm doing with something I've talked to Bobby about, is creating a, uh, a, a private secure network which will not be about blame, but looking for solutions and giving everybody the freedom to express themselves. So, uh, you know, it's, it, it's not an obvious thing, but that I found that that's a very important factor in finding all the intervention points. Well, getting every part of the coalition that could make going upstream possible, making it safe for them to collaborate to allow us to collectively go upstream, I think is yeah. a feasible a feasible thing. Sanjay, yeah, did you want to... Excuse me, let me just comment. There's been a book um, that was uh, uh, written or published, uh, I'm gonna say about a year ago by uh, Professor Amy Edmondson of the Harvard Business School. And it was about how do you create psychological safety in a process? And it's not just uh, people, it's all the different things that are going to keep people from coming forward. So uh, I would suggest that's a, that's a good resource. And I'll, as soon as I can find the title, which I'm trying to find as I'm talking, um, I will put it on the chat box. Well, create, creating, uh, yeah. creating trust for the collaboration to reach the scale and scope of what's needed for systems change to be feasible, I think exists as a context. Sanjay, did you want to introduce yourself for Nikhil's context as well? Sanjay? Uh, oh, it may have, uh, there we go. Can you hear me, Sanjay? Okay, I can't hear Sanjay, so we'll come back to Sanjay. Um, Raj, welcome. Uh, did you want to introduce yourself? Nikhil is joining us from uh, the Skoll Systems Change Observatory, and um, he just joined us here. Did you want to briefly introduce yourself so that he knows who, who's on the line? No, yeah, you're, you're on mute, Raj. Okay, you're on mute, Raj. We'll come back to you when you're not on mute. Okay, no worries. Uh, Saskia, would you like to introduce yourself to Nikhil? He's joined us here from the Systems Change Observatory. Okay, 
Yeah, I am. Ah, uh, Raj is back. Okay, we'll go to. Yeah. Go ahead, Raj. Um, well, um, I, I'm sorry I came in a bit late, so I did not get a son chance to to hear the the pitch from uh, Nikhil. Uh, but yes, uh, the truth and reconciliation, which Michael talked about, is really important. Um, and and it is not an easy process, and it takes a lot of time. It can take years until we we'll we can deal with that. So that, that's that's all I've got to say for the moment. And. Yeah. Uh, Saskia, did you want to um, introduce yourself? Hi, I'll leave it quick as I joined late as well. Um, I'm Saskia based in New Zealand. I head uh, Metro Action, which is the C uh, the uh, non-for-profit uh, partner of Crowdoing, uh, of Bobby in Crowdoing. I also head um, uh, Department of Responsible Management as an executive in a uh, global tourism operator. And um, with that, uh, in a new structure post-COVID, as we are entering post-COVID in New Zealand, which is quite unique in the world, um, we are. Uh, I am looking at um, capacity building and uh, addressing people in a completely different way, which is, uh, I think, very um, aligned often with the things that we talk about here in this group. So very interested again to hear some new ideas today. Absolutely. And that that's warmly welcome. And uh, Sanjay, are we able to hear you now? Would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, uh, no. Okay. I can't hear. I'm sorry. The mic's not working for that. Uh, so I, we, we will include Sanjay when, when the mic's working. Uh, so I think that the the context I'd say for systems change bridging to the systems change observatory context is that we we have uh, lenses on systems change gathered in in the room. One one lens is that there's an institutional design gap for systems change. I'd allude to that in the fair share model example. Another is that we need institutions to go upstream of risks. Uh, hi, Sanjay. Uh, I see you've rejoined us on the other link. Does that mean we can hear you? No. Two Sanjays with no microphone working. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, um, no. Uh, no, excellent. I've always had issue on my um, desktop. So I'm on my phone. Hey, thanks so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, a few things I wanted to share. One was regarding uh, trust. Right. Uh, you're, you're, we're hearing you, but we're hearing you double. So yeah. Let mute, me just, uh, mute the yeah, other one. Go ahead, Sanjay. All right. Um, you know the uh, the survey that Google had done. What is the number one reason for uh, most effective teams? It's trust and uh, um, feeling uh, psychologically safe. So going back to a point that was made before. Um, so I am coming at this from uh, really being a social entrepreneur. And uh, um, right now, uh, uh, Bobby, you may not know, I'm, I'm actually part of a program here in Denver called X Genesis, which is focused on wicked problems around the world. And it's looking at complex adaptive change, but the, how can social entrepreneurship and uh, um, you know, private sector play a role? directly tied to the SDGs. So interesting thing is we're looking at future of work, future of learning, and future of uh, health in the context of post-COVID. And in that context, I am personally looking at food systems, uh, for example, and it's the mother of all uh, complex uh, systems. But the interesting thing, uh, how we are trying to find the balance between uh, entrepreneurs looking to uh, make money while also trying to figure out what is good for the world uh, and uh, uh, looking at complex system change, they actually have used something called the Ikigai, which is a uh, you know, Japanese sense of being, and essentially use that as a mechanism to see, say, hey, if you're going to pursue a particular opportunity, is it valuable for you, the business, the world, and are you good at it, right? So it brings all of those pieces together. So I, I wanted to share that because I thought it was an interesting way to 
uh, have entrepreneurs actually pursue uh, their passions while making a difference in terms of the greater good. And and of course, so thank you for mentioning that. And the yeah. icky guy uh, is uh, interesting because sometimes the universe has multiple signposts, and I, I only learned about it earlier this week, which is why I had the bookmark very handy and accessible. But the idea of um, a reason to jump out of bed in the morning as yeah. a sense of a way to frame purpose um, is is an interesting meta frame, which is to say that if we have systems change at a narrative level, it's saying that we can change the narrative of something that we care about and that affects our narrative. So if we talk about that at Mark Moulton level of uh, homelessness prevention uh, or wildfire prevention collaboration, or if we talk about that at a, at a, at a, at a, at a Raj level of um, allowing nature, natural assets to fend for themselves with uh, digital support. You know, we've um, met social innovation approaches that range from using technology to support humans to uh, getting social innovations embedded in, in other broader processes. So I, I think the, the context is that right now in systems change research, we see some examples of a social innovation frame of reference, like in Jeff Mulligan's open book of social innovation, you see, uh, is, I'm, I'm hearing a background sound from, from one of y'all, um, that, uh, the, 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 in other words, getting social innovations or solutions to match the scale of the problem. I'd say that's one framework for systems change we see. And then we see other kinds of systems change frameworks in the sense of mapping the systems and thinking about not new solutions or solution gap, but just gaps in flows between stakeholders in the system, thinking about social innovation more at the level of what pieces of the system need to be reconnected uh, in different ways, less at the level of what solutions are missing. Nikhil, what, what would you share from the systems change observatory findings thus far in terms of different approaches to systems change that y'all have mapped in this? Or is that is that a way to think about it? Have y'all been mapping different systems change approaches with the systems change observatory research? Um, thank you, Rahul. Uh, that is sort of the aim, but that isn't exactly what we're doing because I think um, some of that work previously has been done you know th there has been a lot of effort to understand what are pathways to create change and as you mentioned matching the scale of the problem you know somehow it took you know 20 30 years of people to realize but now the realization in the social impact space is there that one organization cannot possibly tackle problems that are that large in scale you know and it's been a slow process of realizing that but i mean if you really look at it the entire like scale ethos came in from the Silicon Valley uh, school of thought, right? Like we, we, we were looking for inflection points where uh, rapid scaling happens and that the bigger you scale a problem, the better you get at dealing, tackling a problem. But that's not necessarily true. And that understanding is something we've been seeing. I'll give you guys an example that Omidyar, uh, our, our colleagues from Omidyar love to use. Basically, um, they were talking about pl uh, ocean plastics, right? So there's a there, there's a really big project where they had a barge which is going and collecting ocean plastic uh, from these gyres. You know, there are the five large gyres of waste. Uh, and in the Pacific, there's a really big, large funded project which was collecting ocean waste. Now, the example for that project is, suppose that project is successful at collecting waste at scale, right? Um, end of the day, that project might help retrieve millions of pounds of waste from the ocean, plastic waste. But as long as people, where is the waste coming from? It's coming from people throwing uh, garbage leaking out of systems on land, right? So till the root cause of the problem is tackled, there will forever be more and more plastic to clean up in the ocean. So even though it's an amazing project which can help lots of people, it can extract millions of pounds of plastic, 
it's not really tackling the root cause of the problem, which is uh, waste streams that are not that are leaking from land. So well, that, in isolation, it won't, right? But if you look at yeah. the Harlem Children's Zone frame of systems change, they took a portfolio of 30, 40 social innovations and said these collectively would address it. If that example, if, if yeah. they do their role perfectly, but then they also are part of a systems change uh, <laughs> context where all of the other institutions of the world are, are covering the other dimensions, yes. then they could be a part of the systems change context. Exactly. I want to include um, Peter here because uh, Peter, we have uh, multiple folks on the line. Do you, do you have, who all do you do you know here already, Peter? Have you have you met uh, half the people already here or no? Yeah, I know I know a lot of the folks here. I don't want to disturb and start. I'm sorry, I'm late here. I was involved in other things, but uh, I'm happy just to this melt here. Maybe uh, maybe just do a thirty second intro, Peter, and then we'll we'll include you in the. The thread, and I, I can uh, summarize that we, we've had conversation already from colleagues on the line. Michael's shared around um, getting upstream in prevention. Uh, Nick uh, Nikhil's shared from the Systems Change Observatory at, at, Ox, at Oxford that uh, is looking at systems change approaches. Wilfred's uh, mentioned the legal innovations, uh, le legal tech innovations, and Raj previously shared around. Uh, micro institutions for rivers and mountains and forests and helping those become automatically supportive of human aspirations. Carl's on fair share model and uh, Mark's shared around prevention of risk and Saskia's uh, founded Match for Action Foundation, which we've collaborated on through volunteerism contexts at Crowd Doing. But you want to just briefly introduce yourself, Peter, for folks who haven't met you? Well, uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of Pete Lydon, kind of run a small media company called reInvent in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, did a lot of online internet kind of roundtable things for many years, early in the pioneering days of the early Google Hangouts and stuff. Uh, did a lot, do a lot of um, physical events uh, called What's Now San Francisco. I've been going for five years. When we could gather people, What's Now New York is somewhere kind of gathering of um, innovators in New York. Uh, both of which have been blown to pieces uh, with this. So uh, now we're back to the, the, vir the virtual kind of world of connecting up. But what we're always trying to do is connect up cross-disciplinary kind of innovators in different fields to kind of look at the big picture kind of solutions going forward, which is aligned a lot with with uh, with Bobby and a lot of the, what you guys are doing. So so I'm always so I'm here more to listen and just to graft in and hear how you guys are doing and what you're doing and uh, maybe contribute later when I get a better handle. Absolutely, uh, you're, you're warmly welcome, Peter. And uh, I, I wouldn't have ever been able to get the reframeit.com domain name were it not for your kind introduction more than a decade back to the person who that, had that it for me. That so, was my claim to fame, um, Bobby. I, uh, is, uh, I knew the guy who had that. And we, we the, that deal. bridge uh, originally in this life. But the, uh, the thread that I'd actually more specifically frame reference to is, so we have social innovation clusters as one systems change theory, which is effectively that a social entrepreneur does not have to take comprehensive macro leadership responsibility for the entirety of a global problem because they have an alternative, which is to identify who's going to take on the parts of the problem they're not going to take on. Wilfred, would that dovetail with uh, Sanjay, you're presenting something? I uh, got it. Go ahead. I can't hear you though, Sanjay, but I, I see your screen. <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to share the actual mechanism by which you're trying to find the founder and the opportunity fit. So if people want to take a screenshot, basically you're trying to dovetail and be in the center, right? You might be great at something, you might, you might love something else, but the world might not need it, right? So if people want to take a screenshot, I just wanted to sh share that. Well, I, I think that makes a lot of sense that people yeah. should do what they love. The problem, I'd say, is how do they have this opportunity without breaching the Leibniz paradox, which I think is what gives rise then to a systems change context. Because yep. we have, um, if, if, if there's 300 fields that affect your work that you need to know, and you have one lifetime, not 10 lifetimes to get mastery of it, how do you collaborate with enough others of like mindset to be able to achieve requisite variety of de-risking capacity to build the social innovation right. I think in some cases it uh, happens because people pretend they have it 
and they get lucky and they still create us uh, an invention or innovation. But I think in order to get systems change level of strategically orienting, NVU has been able to get to having a majority of their social innovations scale and sustain over time towards systemic change. How do we create enough confidence in systems change having a chance at success for it to work? It could be that we have enough social innovations that we have a constellation of them where they're addressing every dimension of risk. So I guess that, that comes back to the upstream point um, from, oh, go ahead, Michael. I was gonna say, one of the things I have found in a variety of contexts is surprisingly, if you ask a population, people in a population, very often the, those that you might consider opinion leaders, what not particularly obvious change would signal to them that there is system change happening, you get surprising answers. And sometimes you get very high impact answers from very small actions. So as strange and as simplistic as it sounds, um, if you frame the question the right way, uh, then, you might it might yield uh, a sequence of quick early wins that have outsized impact. And yeah, I, so I, I give you a lot of examples yeah, so of that. I don't think systems change automatically has to be the most difficult thing that anyone can ever do. I think some part kinds of systems change are elegantly simple and have consequences and cascades of such. Go ahead, Rush. Yeah, I like I like to add to that. Um, I mean, I think we you know we we take for granted system change means something tangible, and, it, and that may not be the case. And um, sometimes when you can't change a system, non-participation, non-collaboration also helps to drive system change. Non-participation, you're yeah. saying? Yeah. 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 Opting out of a system that's not working so that you have space to opt in for a system that can work for you and for others. Yeah. I mean, if you look at um, um, revolutions that have happened, you know, you look at uh, across the world and, and at, at some point it was non-participation that led to system change because the system collapsed on its, on, onto itself. So... Mm -hmm. And, and one of the problems... So, so, that, so that, that, that brings up the interesting point, which is that to Wilfred's point, we don't want the systems change goal should not be an excuse for purpose washing. And if we're going to give every systems change maker the chance to have a role in the aspirational goal, then it means not conflating aspirational wishes with aspirational roles. In other words, we're not, I mean, the wonderful thing about solar punk is it bans magical thinking. You're only allowed to put in solar punk something that doesn't violate the laws of physics. There's no science fiction appeals court where you can get permission to violate the laws of physics, so they don't allow you to. But Wilfred, did you want to speak to this, the, the level of opting in versus opting out of a narrative role in systems change vis-a-vis -vis this purpose for real versus purpose washing? context of that those two intersecting spectrums maybe yeah i think in in law or injustice it's just a little bit clearer or you can create system change faster by in, like inserting new legislation or so there is um this system change bit in law becomes it seems more you can you can capture it easier but i think what i see is that many people who step out of the system to change it they struggle to, um, you know, they become outsiders. That often means a little bit isolated, a little bit poor, uh, like so, and there's a whole, so, and if you want a large scale uh, change, then you need a lot of people who are willing to do that for a little while. Um, so. I'd like to, 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 to add in what you said. Um, you know, you say law helps to, you know, help to complement system change, but when we are in such a state at, at the world we live in, where mm. we are in patchwork regulation, things are broken down, 
Um, the financial system is broken down. The economic system is broken down. Our social systems are broken down. Cultural systems almost breaking down. And we keep doing the patchwork regulation. And it, it, it seems like we're getting better. It seems like we can recover, you know, but, you know, but it's not helping. Um, and, and this is how, you know, the, the, it goes back to this old um, story. I'm sure you can you find it on, on YouTube about the frog in, 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 in hot water. You put mm -hmm. a frog in hot water, he jumps out immediately because it's hot. You put a frog in, in, in cool water and you gently turn the heat on, he keeps adapting and adapting and adapting. And this is, this is what's going on. It's been going on for the last 40 years, it's been going on perhaps you know, even longer than that. And if we want real system change, we have to see that you know, if the system is broken, you can't patchwork it. Well, if that's the metaphor, then arguably every human on Earth leaped out of the slowly boiling water and so they I, entered I, the new I, pandemic I, I, realm. I don't, I don't of, think so. I think the, 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 the situation we are in at the moment is we are all adapting to the point of just killing ourselves. And this is I see. You're, so you're saying we're just, we're, so, so I thought you were going to say the pandemic was what caused us to be able to, 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 to have a, a larger shift in self aware, shift oh, towards self awareness. I, I, I agree. I agree that uh, a pandemic or a, or a um, punctual crisis can help with a conscious awakening, but it depends on how deep that that shock was. So if we are six weeks well, later... That, that, that brings up the point, which is, I think, to Mike, Michael's thread, that every uh, institutional leader is having... Well, are they, are they discovering exponential self-awareness and are they able to access it, more it depends, empathy? Yeah, it depends on, on, on how serious this is. So if it's six weeks in, on lockdown, and then we are back to having huge queues in front of McDonald's and in front of the Gucci sh uh, shops. Then, then obviously, we've not is not deep enough, and none of us have seen people fall dead in the streets. And there's just been a lot of old people in old folks' well, homes. Very tragic. I mean, I think it's yeah, I, I, know, I know is, are are horrible. I know. But, but, then, but, I, but I think then we have thought eight. about. I mean, and so look, so look, there's different parts of opportunity for collective uh, agency and systems change. It, it doesn't mean that every kind of systems change is um, a, a revolution. You can also talk about systems change at the level of it changes it for those humans to be able to access their intentionality. And it, it, it doesn't only have to be from a system breaking. It could also become from you know the Buckminster Fuller scenario for systems change is create a new system that outcompetes the hold and makes the old obsolescent, which is... I, I, I get your point, but, but we're not there yet. To, to have the new system in place, we need the new incentives in place. And the new incentives are not in place. So we've, we've had... Well, a I, I, think that the, I think the incentives for... Well, I'd say that it depends on which, which piece of incentivization. So I'd say that the incentives for collaboration exist in the world. We, we've... We found that across a quarter million hours of volunteers collaborating with us, that you can create intrinsic incentives for participation. I think there's extrinsic incentives that exist in the sense of, you know, institutions and individuals are at risk, and anytime they're at risk, that creates an extrinsic incentive. But maybe this is a good time to bring to Saskia. What do you think of this question of whether the incentives already exist, or do we need to create them for systems change to be feasible? I think there is a uh, minority that understands that these incentives that, that act on the incentives that know what the what the benefits are of doing it. But I definitely think that we're still at the very start of that curve, and we haven't we haven't by no ways have we meet, have we reached a tipping point in that. And okay. that's what that's what I mean. I, I think the, yeah. I mean, I think one example is if we make. Uh, the, 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 the singularity of service learning for professional development, where anyone who wants to become the best project manager to be, they can be has to service learn to become the best project manager they can be. Same with human resource business partners or product managers and every one of many thousands of skills. If everyone learns their short-term goal best by contributing to systems change, that, that would be one incentive singularity. 
Well, what are the other incentive singularities where there's exponential abundance for incentivization that exists in a systems change context? Uh, Nikhil, do you have feedback on that from systems change observatory research? Um, yeah, if, if I could add to Raj and Wilfred's point from earlier about opting out of systems, uh, something that, I mean, I've heard come up with my discussions with other people we've been speaking to is um, there is a growing understanding that we sometimes have a lack of agency in changing systems because change, systems change inherently means that systems are changing all the time already with or without us, right? Um, that, that even though in your own role, you can do a certain action, it's impossible to assign causality between you and a system changing. Um, so in that sense, people are trying to come back to the same question about incentives, you know, that even if we design something, structure it, there is no way for us to know what exactly the impact will be, when it, how long it will take. Um, if you guys are familiar with Bridgespan's work on um, uh, scale, uh, change initiatives, uh, they did a good case study of 10 system change uh, initiatives that have worked over time, you know, uh, including examples like apartheid in South Africa. You know, it wasn't something that happened in a couple of years. It took 20 plus years of concerted efforts and violence. And, and there are several other examples. But I mean, in the example of apartheid in South Africa, legal apartheid in South Africa uh, was addressed, but you could say that systemic inequalities in South Africa remains. So is that a case study in process or in progress of systems change? Or is that a, a case study of systems change that declared victory at a legal change, per Wilfred's point, but didn't achieve the... I, I don't think the, 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 the comprehensive dream of Mandela has been achieved in that sense mm -hmm. in, in South Africa. So h how would that be framed? I think with the legal um, change question, uh, I come back to the Donella Meadows levers of change. If you guys are familiar with that, she uh, basically came up with an index of levels of change from you know 12 different things you can do from most easiest and least um, effective to most uh, most difficult and most effective. The easiest thing was to change tax policy laws, you know, uh, which basically might or might not be enforced. Uh, easier to do, um, slightly less effective because people can opt out of following them. It can be a patchwork legislation. Um, the hardest thing to do and most effective is changing people's mindsets. Changing someone's outlook is the most effective thing you could possibly do, right? For any of these change initiatives, but it's also the hardest thing to do. So well, hardest in some ways, but easiest in others. In other words, in the deliberative poll in Northern Ireland, we did there, my, my dad led and I was assisting, you know, there were a hundred people who gathered for 12 hours to dialogue and their level of empathy, Catholics emp empathy for Protestants and Protestants empathy for Catholic was measured. And, it went up dramatically by, uh, you know, 25 to 33% increase in terms of the percentage willing to have their kids on this shared campus and that the other was open to reason. And 18 months later, that 12 hours compared to the control group uh, were still two thirds of the change of attitude was, was in place. So if, if the attitude towards the other is what you want to change, it may just take a day of transformation to create years of, of consequence in, in attitude. But I, th I think the changing mindsets, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, may maybe you need uh, millions of people to go through transformation processes to reach systemic change context. That was 100 people. So yeah. I, I would just like to add, you know, you we imagine that everybody is really intelligent and with a bit more information, a bit more education, they, you know, you upgrade themselves into a system change. But it comes down to carrot and stick. So I like what Nikhil said about tax. So taxes is one thing, subsidies are one thing, and you know, uh, punishment. You know, things that they get punished for some things. That's another thing. We we are sheep's. We, we we are sheep's in any system. In any we we think we live in a democracy system, but we don't. You know, look at America. You know, look at it. Look at how how long it takes America, Black America, to to come out of you know Black America. Uh, look at the pr police brutality under Obama and now under Donald Trump. I mean, 
uh, it's it's madness. If you ask if you ask any children, to, a child to look at this, he'll say it's madness. We need a system change. But how long has it has it been going on? It's been going on for so long. And who is to blame? The American voter, the American government, the Senate, the president? Nobody. Everybody's just innocent. Well, or the inspector calls the play shows that each one fulfilled the limits of their role, and yet collectively they murdered someone in the play. And the equivalent is true in the case of systems gap in America. Is if you know each individual institution takes uh, the 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 limits of their responsibility demarcated by the the law, but the collective supererogatory is that that's not good enough for us given the level of these problems. So I, I think the, 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 the question of how do we have agency vis-a-vis -vis these risks, I mean, I'll tell you that when we did a analysis um, during our Marin project, the, they said that half of all child abuse and neglects, uh, serious cases are pr predicted by earlier minor child abuse and neglect. And this particular example in the US context, there were more than 15 different past uh, failures to uh, push the person out of the police force that created this tragedy that caused the the riot. So you know, the, the, in in this case, you know, there's there's a sense of going upstream. I can I met someone that works for Democratic uh, Party consultant who said that they have you know ten thousand data points about each uh, each voter that they have a profile of. Well, I think if you look at ten thousand data points about each person who's at risk of abusing their authority, there's probably you know other kinds of things that you can see in in the public evidence, not just about their their misbehavior that uh, was formally identified in the police record. That you know, so I think that you could probably get upstream of this pro this kind of problem too. I mean, I think it's it's certainly a category where look uh, uh, upstream is just saying that you know it, it's it's it, it, that we do not have entirely things that come out of left field. That that we do not have um, you know only black swan events, that we have things that we are able to be anticipatory about. And if we want to seize the, the Buckminster Fuller mandate of comprehensive anticipatory design science, it's saying, how do we design fast enough for us to be a part of the cascade of prevention through our intentions becoming collective agency that is, is feasible? Um, I, I think that's the wish. Michael, does that would that be the eighteen levels of prevention that we were talking about? That that is that's getting collective agency is preventing at every intervention point that could give us a fraction of the collective agency to prevent the whole outcome. I, it would, but again, the point I would make is uh, some intervention points are going to have greater power than others, and we should. If we are working with a problem, particularly something like uh, health inequities in our population, we shouldn't presume that we know the prevention point is the best. Uh, I uh, am on an advisory board for a, an initiative called Wellville, and uh, one of my colleagues is a senior uh, planner and strategist and funder from the California Endowment, Dr. Tony Eiton. And very much where I was 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, he believed that nutrition, exercise, uh, housing were the number one, two, or three intervention points. And he discovered that it was, what he said, the ability of people to have power to change the odds in their favor that had higher impact. So gestures that intervened to give people power over their lives mattered more. And just as well, I- Well, maybe that we need to create many dimensions of agency for them through intervention points. Maybe each intervention point is an opportunity for their agency. Yeah, and when I look at my health initiatives at Pitney Bowes, I thought it was on-site clinics better health insurance, uh, better food, better exercise. And I discovered after the fact that it was giving people a sense of purpose, valuing them as human beings, and taking the troubles down so they weren't insecure about their jobs every single day. 
that those were far more important. I just did I did them, but did not know that at the time. And that's why looking back, if I could do things differently, I would ask the people to tell me or to tell anybody, other change agent, if you were going to uh, make a difference, what would you say would make the biggest difference? And you start getting a triangulation around certain actions over other actions. I agree, you got to do 18 interventions prevention point, but maybe numbers 5, 8, and 11 are more important than the other 15 to get you 80% of the way. I think it would be excellent to get collective agency through such. We're going to have to wrap up momentarily. Saskia, did you have last words before we adjourn? No, thanks, Bobby. Uh, this was, again, very interesting. I like the, the, the discussion that we were heading on. It's always a shame that we have to stop. <laughs> I appreciate that. Likewise, Nikhil, any last words before we adjourn? Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, it was nice to meet all of you. I look forward to joining more calls and getting to know all of you better. Phenomenal. And uh, last words before we adjourn, Wilfred? No, thanks again. It was a pleasure. Uh, last words before we adjourn, Peter? Uh, last words before we adjourn, Carl? I'm muted there. Sorry. Um, no, I'm sorry I came late, and so I only picked up a bit of it, but I, 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 the sense I'm getting from many quarters is we're in a remarkable moment right now, and that things, a lot of things that have frustrated us for so long uh, may not, uh, may be giving way a little bit more than ever, than we've seen it for a long time. So I'm, I'm May everything that frustrates us. May everything that frustrates systemic change makers give way to allow systemic change to be achieved at the scale, scope, and relevant resonance of our aspirations for a better world. And I think that uh, your, 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 your reflection, Peter, is uh, something I've hacked into a, a benediction because uh, I, I, I have great wish for it. Uh, last words before we adjourn, Raj? Um, well, I'd like to say that you know our own bodies are a system and uh, how we can break down in terms of health, we can lose our health, and yet we know we can rebuild the health. <clears throat> so when we talk about system change, I mean, what does it take to get our bodies right? Um, and I think if we understand that, uh, th I think that would be like a starting point to also, you know, starting to get understand at a broader level across people and across cultures. And I think we, we, in the next session, we really have to clearly define what what do we mean about system change? Do we is that something positive? I had. And well, yeah. I mean, we would frame it in a way that is constructive, but we've also had. Uh, differences and diverse opinions about systems change definitions. So we don't need to have a monopoly on systems change. What we need is a Venn diagram of a shared space for us to get the systems change that is most needed and most important to be feasible together through each other's collective auspices so that we have the requisite but we, variety. We don't know that. That's the problem. We don't know that. I, I'm not sure which part we don't know. I think we know that there's different opinions about systems change. We do know that yeah. there's different definitions, but you're yeah. saying we don't know that there are different definitions? No, I'm saying we don't know what a system change, uh, if it's positive or it's negative, we, we don't know. Well, it, I think there are changes in systems that are positive and negative, but what we mean by systems change is creating agency at the scale of shifting systems so that we can achieve collective intentions. Systems change to make a, whether it's a solar punk world feasible or to get the social innovation density to the scope of our problems. I, I think the wishes and aspirations of all the social entrepreneurs of the world, the Venn diagram of those would be systems change. But uh, happy to continue this thread on a future occasion and maybe we can uh, cross reference <laughs> this to different perspectives on systems change. Certainly open to sharing uh, the systems change uh, research that we've been reading and that we've been reviewing and the systems change work that we are shepherding ourselves. I think that it's not a context where we can have omniscience about how to achieve systems change. I, I think it's a matter of a collaborative improvisation at the scale of the problems to be able to have agency vis-a-vis -vis these problems. And I think that if we can collaborate 
deeply enough across disciplinary lines to bridge these fields together, there's few problems that we cannot gain collective agency towards across time. A pleasure. Thank, Thank you all to all of you. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Raj. What, what did, I didn't hear. I, I didn't I just think it's, it's always a pleasure being being here in this space, and 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 I think the most beautiful thing about what's happening is not just the systems change; it, it's how we see the system and and which part of the wheels we don't see, and and, and how do we deal with what's the visible and the invisible, you know? Uh, and um, so it's always a pleasure to 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 wake up to that awakening, and to put words and concepts to things huh? so thank you we can only have we can only have agency with regards to the parts of the system that we can see but that collective process can give us agency over time vis-a-vis -vis the parts of it that d we don't see but have consequences for us all and Absolutely. with that i i wish you all to have a phenomenal friday and looking forward to continuing threads thank you all for collaborating on hashtag systems change today take care <laughs>